Hello, everyone. My name is Janet Jacobson. I'm co-director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women, and I'm very happy to welcome you to tonight's event in honor of the book with Freedom in Our Ears, Histories of Jewish Anarchism. Um, tonight's event is taking place online, but we are all physically located someplace, and we recognize that all land is indigenous land. The land on which Barnard College was built in, is part of the traditional and unceded territory of the Lenape people of the Delaware Nation. The Lenape were displaced from their homelands to places as far as what is now Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and Ontario, Canada. We pay respect to indigenous peoples past, present, and future and uplift their continuing presence on their homelands. We also acknowledge the legacy of forced displacement and enslavement of African people. We understand that our existence, those of us especially at Barnard on this campus, using the resources of this institution has been enabled by a history of both land and labor extraction. Just a note on accessibility um, for this evening. In terms of accessibility, you can find a link to access live transcription for this event directly under the video in the YouTube video de description or on the BCRW event page. In addition, we are very happy to have with us um, ASL interpreters from Body Language Productions. We work with them often and we are always grateful for their assistance. Additional thank, thank yous include our co-sponsor, the Program in Jewish Studies at Barnard College, and of course, the BCRW staff that made this possible, including Hope Dector, Sandra Moyana, Arisa, Olivia Cummings, Pamela Phillips, Sophie Kreitzberg, Kelsey Kitsky, and of course, my co-director, Pramila Nadison. I would also like to thank our captioner for this evening, Marie Villarreal, and all of you for joining us this evening. So what we're gonna do tonight, and I'm trying to, I have to scroll down to find, to get to the bios is, okay, um, what we're gonna do tonight is to um, go through our three presenters um, and they, sorry, I'm just gonna pull up my bios here. All right. And they will be speaking in the following order. I will introduce each of them uh, and then we'll have conversation. We'll have conversation amongst them and with you, the audience. So if you have a question that you want to ask, um, please put it into the chat and um, we will read the chat and ask our presenters. So our first presenter this evening will be one of the co-editors of the book. All right, um, who is Kenyon Zimmer, who um, is uh, from the University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, that will be followed by uh, the second co-editor, Ana Elena Torres from the University of Chicago. Um, and then we will have, uh, we'll be joined by one of the contributors, Samuel Brody from the University of Kansas. Um, we're very happy to be able to bring you this book. I know that my students, I think many of the students at, at Barnard College and, and um, in the world today are interested in uh, what genealogies they can draw on to make a better world. That is one of the, their greatest questions. Um, as I was reading this book, I have to admit that I was mostly thinking about my students in environmental uh, humanities who are somewhat desperate for ways to change the world. And the idea that there are these genealogies available to them, including the ones that are so lovingly uh, presented in the book. The level of history is amazing and the attention to both what's happened in the past, what people have done and made of their lives and of this world and what could be in the future is truly inspiring. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kenyon. Kenyon? Thank you so much, uh, Janet. Let's see. Um, I need to have my slides pulled up here. So what I'm gonna do is talk uh, sort of in general about the book, introduce it a little bit. Um, if we can go to the next slide here. Uh, the origins of this uh, collaboration between Anna and I, the two editors, actually goes back to 2006 when we were both um, 
uh, we were both students at the intensive Yiddish uh, program at the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst, Massachusetts, back when I was a graduate student and Anna was an undergrad. Um, we had a shared interest in this elusive history of um, Yiddish speaking Jewish anarchists and radicals. Uh, and we kept in touch on and off since that time. Uh, eventually in 2018, with a little delay, uh, things started getting rolling again. We uh, collaborated with some other scholars, including Sam Brody, who's here tonight, um, on some panels at the 2018 American Jewish Studies Conference. And then the following year, uh, next slide, we, uh, Anna and I again collaborated uh, with a number of other people on a very successful conference at the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research in New York City on Yiddish anarchism, uh, which had an amazing turnout, showed a lot of, uh, of interest in the topic. And that led us to pull together um, some of the contributors from both of those events uh, into this anthology. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is a, a compilation of studies of Jewish anarchism. Uh, which naturally leads to the question, what is anarchism? Um, for the purposes of this volume, we uh, kept the, the contributions to studies of self-identified Jewish anarchists, so people of Jewish descent who self-identified as adherents to anarchist ideology. Uh, next slide. Which, um, as we say in the introduction, um, the core of anarchist ideology in practice is refusal of social domination. Anarchism opposes the inequitable system of capitalism and all centralized governments, whether left or right wing regimes. It critiques the hierarchical structure of state power itself. And this is what, what separates anarchism from most other left wing uh, ideologies and varieties of socialism. Uh, we continue, but anarchists' critique of authority extends well beyond just the state and capital. They take aim at all political, economic, and social hierarchies based upon force or coercion, including state communism and forms of domination based upon race, class, gender, sexuality, nationality, and citizenship. Next slide, please. Uh, as a positive doctrine, Anarchism holds that it is both desirable and possible to reorganize society and institutions according to principles of individual and group autonomy, self-determination, and mutual aid. Its constellation of aspirations includes bodily autonomy, gender and racial equality, and a world without borders or prisons. So I know that was a long quotation, but I think it gets to most of the major points um, about what anarchists uh, are both for and against. Uh, anarchism is not simply reducible to anti-statism. Uh, so what does it mean to be a Jewish anarchist specifically? Um, next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that we really wanted to highlight in this volume is that there is no one answer to that question. There's no one way that people have been or can be or should be Jewish anarchists. There's no one way to combine these things. Um, next slide. So uh, again, quoting from our introduction, the volume traces multiple and capacious Jewish anarchisms, plural, each of which shares certain features and influences in common with some, but not necessarily all others. So rather than an irreducible quality of Jewishness, individual Jewish anarchists shared a multivalent matrix of secular, cultural, and religious influences, some of them distinctly Jewish and some of them not, that they selectively drew upon within specific circumstances and contexts. Um, so in other words, there's a whole variety of ways that these elements were combined and then combined with other elements um, to form distinct versions of Jewish anarchism or anarchisms in which uh, anarchist movements in which Jews were active. Uh, next slide, please. 
So this is a badly neglected history. One of the major things we were trying to do with this volume is uh, right, expand uh, people's awareness of how much of this history is yet to be discovered and how much is being discovered by uh, sort of a new generation of scholars. Um, so one of the only book length studies of Jewish anarchism uh, was by written in night or published in 1945 by Joseph Cohen, an American uh, Russian American Jewish anarchist, uh, which will only be appearing published in English for the first time ever in June of this year. So we're looking forward to that. But uh, next slide. Uh, in that work, uh, Cohen notes uh, our comrades did not write history; they made history. The work of systematically recording events was left to other often hostile elements who ignored our contributions, often maliciously misrepresenting it, trying to give the impression that we simply disrupted others' work, tilting at windmills and contributing nothing constructive ourselves. Um, and this is a rather accurate description even today in the 21st century of the state of uh, scholarship on the history of Jewish anarchism in the US and globally. Um, much of that history has been uh, historically written by uh, activists and historians, uh, largely of some variety of Marxist influence, who generally, uh, if they address the anarchist movement at all, view it as sort of this ephemeral moment of the 1880s and 1890s that kind of inevitably declined in the face of the rise of, of Marxism of various kinds. Um, so we are definitely uh, hoping to push back against that in, with this volume. Um, if we can get the next slide. So here's a sneak peek at the table of contents, which across 10 chapters, we have contributions that cover Jewish anarchists in the United States, in England, in Germany, in Russia from the 1880s um, through the 1950s and beyond using sources in English, German, Yiddish, Russian, and Hebrew. Um, so another, so in addition to the chronological expansion of focus, we were very interested in the geographical expansion of focus and the linguistic expansion that Jewish anarchists weren't only active in writing in Yiddish, but in other languages as well, depending on uh, where and when. And this is also an interdisciplinary work where we have historians, we have art historians, we have uh, people who work in comparative literature, in theology, and in sociology. Um, next slide, please. So uh, another thing that we wanted to make available was translations of some of this multilingual work. So there's also an online um, supplement of translated primary documents that, uh, which has original translations of documents from German, Russian, and Yiddish related to individual contributions. Um, and yeah, the, the breadth of the chapters, the, the supplemental material, the, the volume as a whole shows that um, Jewish anarchism existed in many kinds of ways, intersected and overlapped with many other non-Jewish radical movements was influenced them and was in turn influenced by them. Um, and that there was, uh, you know, Jewish anarchists were never not Jewish, but they were never just Jewish either. So we are, uh, I think one of the things we hopefully uh, successfully accomplished with this book is getting at um, this expansive, diverse world of Jewish anarchism. Uh, and I just want to leave in the next slide with uh, some some recommendations for further reading beyond just this book, although you should read this book first. Uh, some, some books by uh, those of us who are here today that further explore some elements of uh, Jewish anarchist history. And then next slide. Um, there are several other important uh, works that are cited uh, in With Freedom in Our Ears, that both that are historical works and more contemporary meditations on uh, what it means to be a Jewish anarchist that uh, we believe would be useful to those interested in the topic.
And with that, I will hand it on over to my co-editor. Hi, um, I'm very glad to be here today. I want to thank the organizers and the interpreters, and I'm just pulling up the slides now. Um, I'm speaking to you today from Chicago, um, which I acknowledge is built upon the ancestral homelands of the Council of Three Fires. And Chicago today is home to the third largest population of urban natives in the United States. Um, I hope that you can see the slides now. Uh, wonderful, thank you. So um, yes, um, I will be speaking about a theme of language, which is quite significant, quite significant um, in our anthology. Um, and I'll be speaking in particular about three aspects related to anarchism and language. The first is poetry, the second is language politics, and the third is translation. Now, why is it that literature and art um, and language are so significant for Jewish anarchism? Well, when anarchists decenter representational politics as the primary political realm, culture and art instead become the spheres of transformation for society in addition to the building of mutual aid and the practice of direct action. And in material terms, it was often Jewish anarchists in the 20th century who were willing to fight for um, free artistic speech. A number of the key trials, including Jacob Abrams versus uh, the United States during the Red Scare, uh, which was the prosecution of Yiddish editors for sedition, uh, for opposing militarism um, under uh, Woodrow Wilson. This was one key free speech case. Another one was Allen Ginsberg's trial for the poem Howell, um, as well as the publication of James Joyce's poetry. All of those uh, free speech issues related to literature um, were uh, organized um, in some way by Jewish anarchists in the United States. So they also thought of the practice of artistic freedom as a key part um, of Jewish anarchism. Um, and this model of seeing uh, aesthetics in the avant-garde as uh, an anarchist practice is somewhat different from other socialist and communist models. Um, for example, Arne glantz Leilis, who was um, a follower of Trotsky, uh, said, quote, art is the handmaiden of the labor movement, and it is the responsibility of every, uh, of every worker to write poetry. So that's a somewhat different model from this kind of attentiveness um, to thinking of art itself as a practice of anarchism. And our anthology takes its name uh, from a poem by the militant Yiddish poet, Arne Glantz, or, or, uh, David Edelstadt. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and uh, he, this was a poet writing in the um, 1880s, 1890s. Um, and you can see in this uh, poem from which we take our title, the last stanza is, quote, not showered by a few late tears, no, but with freedom in our ears, roaring the tyrant's epitaph, let me die proudly with a laugh. So you can see this kind of prefigurative gesture of um, already declaring the tyrant dead, right? Um, so thinking of art and literary production as a kind of prefigurative space. Um, in addition to the introductions, close readings of Edelstadt and other poets, we have a number of chapters that focus on artistic production, including Binyamin Hanyadi's chapter on political satire, Ellen Antliff's chapter on the photographer Alfred Stieglitz, who talks about the modernist gallery as an anarchist space, as well as Anya Eisman's um, chapter on prison stories by um, Russian Jewish anarchists, uh, as well as Ayala Brin's chapter about the Yiddish anarchist press and its coverage of the McKinley assassination. Um, so I'd like to briefly give you a sense of the scope of the Yiddish anarchist press using some graphics, which are um, by Kenyon Zimmer, but from his first book, not from the anthology. Um, so here you can see uh, the circulation and the peak of the American anarchist press overall. And here a comparison of the Yiddish and the Italian anarchist press. And it's important to emphasize the multilingualism 
of the anarchist press in the US as well as transnationally. Uh, Chicago alone was home to at least 37 anarchist newspapers in several languages um, between 1879 and um, around World War I. Um, in addition, there were more than 50 newspapers that were Yiddish anarchist only in Yiddish. Um, and these circulated between North America, Argentina, Palestine, Poland, France, and the Pale of Settlement. Um, in London, a single newspaper, Arbeiterfreund, had a circulation of more than 5,000. Uh, and here's an image from Arbeiterfreund to give you a sense of the aesthetics. Um, you can see this attentiveness to uh, romanticism, uh, this cosmic vision of, of anarchist literature, right? The planets above it. Um, and here is another image from the Yiddish anarchist press, Bread and Freedom, uh, Breut und Freiheit. Uh, and this was um, the one year anniversary of the Russian revolution and they published the entire newspaper in red ink. Um, so I just wanted to give you a visual sense of, uh, of the newspapers um, that were a part of this, um, both, both transnational and multilingual. Um, and then turning to this question, right, so there's the press as a material engine for the movement, but then there's also the question of language ideology, right, and Jewish political movements tend to also be linguistic movements. Um, Zionism, for example, expresses the idea of a single language, Hebrew, as the, uh, as the, not a, but the Jewish language for a Jewish state. Uh, Bundism, um, also upheld Yiddish as the single international language for the Jewish proletariat. Um, and uh, in the, um, under Ataturk as well, there were kind of politics around the transformation of Ladino. Um, this is not an exclusively Ashkenazi phenomenon, um, but there is a sense in which language expresses a Jewish politic. So what were the um, anarchist responses to these kind of state language planning uh, programs that they were contemporaneous with. Um, one thing to note is that while there were many internal debates around language for the Jewish anarchists, there was a sense of investment in multilingualism as multilingualism. Um, so Jewish anarchists might speak Yiddish, Hebrew, Russian, German, English, Esperanto, French, Spanish, Ladino, or a combination thereof. Um, and one of the particularly fascinating um, uh, proponents of a Jewish anarchist linguistics was named Wolf Livovich Gordon, um, who invented, um, he invented a language called AO. And the idea was that language is plastic and the transformation of language can transform society. And so Wolf Gordon invented this language AO to express a kind of anarchist idea um, in which uh, one would get rid of gender um, gender oppression by getting rid of um, the uh, uh, gendered forms of the words, as well as getting rid of private property by getting rid of the possessive case, the genitive case, um, and possessive pronouns. Um, so for Gordon, there was an idea of linguistics as a prefigurative strategy, um, hastening through language a future egalitarian world. So Gordon is one expressed one form of uh, Jewish anarchist language politics. Um, much more famous than Gordon's utopian language is Esperanto, which was created by a Bialystok born a man named Ludwig Zamenhof. Um, and uh, uh, Zamenhof had ideas that Esperanto would be a universal second language into which everything could be translated and it would promote a kind of moral community or an ethical community uh, for the whole world. And regardless of Zamenhof's own individual politics, Esperanto got taken up um, by anarchist groups um, in uh, many regions, including in France, there was a group of the anarcho-Esperantists. Um, and uh, in Western Europe, um, as well, it became, um, became taught in schools. Anti-fascists in Germany and Portugal uh, also took up Esperanto as a kind of linguistic opposition uh, to fascism. Um, but it was during the rise of Stalinism that many Esperantists were, um, were executed and Esperanto was seen as something dangerously cosmopolitan, which is a familiar aspersion against Jews and anarchists as well. Um, however, not all Jewish anarchists celebrated Esperanto, and there was a real heterogeneity 
um, in thinking about anarchist language politics. Um, one of the people who opposed Esperanto was the German Jewish uh, philosopher Gustav Landauer, who wrote a pamphlet called Do Not Learn Esperanto. And um, he considered Zamenhof as misdiagnosing the question, right? It's not, um, it's not multiplicity or diversity that's the issue. Um, and he, uh, Landauer writes, quote, the diversity of languages is nothing to be, be lamented. Even less so is it something we can abolish. What we need to abolish are the conditions that keep humans from learning foreign languages. Um, so we can see here this Jewish anarchist um, ethic of multilingualism, of opposing linguistic hegemony, and a kind of um, anti-utopian uh, anti thinking if utopianism means the erasure of difference. Um, and Kropotkin, a uh, classical uh, Russian anarchist who was not Jewish, um, wrote a book called uh, Mutual Aid, which is uh, still taken up and, and engaged with um, in the contemporary world. Um, and in the in the Yiddish, uh, in the English and, and Russian versions of Mutual Aid, he never explicitly uh, uses the word uh, anarchism or socialism. But in the 1913 translation of Mutual Aid, um, Kropotkin has this interesting seven page introduction written for this Yiddish uh, edition, which um, I have on the screen. You can see uh, this interesting passage where Kropotkin adds in, quote, multilingualism is the surest way to enrich our general heritage, Yerusha, from all nationalities and tribes, which have a special value for philosophy, theory, poetry, and art. Um, and here Kropotkin is critiquing the idea of the centralization of culture and states, um, saying, uh, lamenting that, quote, they will become gobbled up by larger nations and so rapidly forget their mother tongue. Um, and so here as well as with Landau, Kropotkin is uh, placing particular value in linguistic and cultural heterogeneity and multiplicity uh, as a way of opposing other trends in socialism um, and communism. Um, and a final aspect of uh, anarchist language politics that I want to mention is translation. Um, several contributors to our volume ask, how did historical anarchists use translation to articulate a specifically Jewish anti-statism? What makes a translation anarchist, aesthetically, methodologically, or theoretically? Um, and, and we argue that translation and anarchism hold many resonances. One is that translation is an inherently collective process, which destabilizes notions of singularity, mastery, and the original. Um, and anarchists have long committed to supporting translation. There are studies by Shokanishi on Japanese and Russian uh, anarchism and translation. Um, and for the Jewish anarchist press in its many languages, translation was really an engine of contact and conversation. Uh, with other world literatures. Um, and even today, groups like the Institute for Anarchist Studies devote funds to the project of translation um, and in, as a form of encounter and mutual legibility, um, coalition building, translation as a practice of solidarity. Um, so these aspects, the uh, anarchist emphasis on the avant-garde, on innovative aesthetics, on um, the practice of, uh, on art as a practice of anarchism and freedom, uh, is one aspect of Jewish anarchist approaches to, um, to language politics. The second is this emphasis on heterogeneity and multilingualism against the single language ideologies. Um, and then the third aspect that I've uh, mentioned is uh, as, a com as a component of Jewish anarchist language politics would be the valuation of translation. Um, so poetry, uh, translation and language politics as realms of the practice of Jewish anarchism. Um, and I'll conclude just by saying um, today, I think there are very significant resonances with um, decolonial language politics in this moment with some of the debates around uh, multilingualism um, and uh, critique of linguistic hegemony that we see 100 and 150 years ago. Um, thinking about a way of emphasizing the survival of the minor language, of the non-territorial language, thinking about language as a vessel of culture and identity um, and opposing the collapse of difference um, by, um, by emphasizing 
um, translation, multilingualism, and these other encounters. Um, so thank you. That's just, just a, a brief taste of Jewish anarchist thinking on language and language politics. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks to Anna and Kenyon for editing this book. And thanks to the organizers for having me. Um, and thanks to the interpreters. Um, I'm speaking to you today from Lawrence, Kansas, uh, which is the forcefully ceded land of the Ka, Osage, and Shawnee, and currently home. Uh, those people were mainly uh, exiled to Oklahoma and other places. Um, but the Prairie Band, Potawatomi, Kickapoo, Sac and Fox, and Iowa peoples, many of whom were pushed here from elsewhere, are still here. Um, and um, I'm going to speak today about religion. My chapter in the book, um, the, you just heard from the two editors of the book. I'm just one of the contributors. Um, my chapter deals with the role of religion in a small segment of the Jewish anarchist movement. And I think it's important to frame this by saying that anarchism was broadly speaking, not just a secular movement, but an anti-religious movement. The presence of religious anarchists, I don't want to just you know, pretend to know percentages, but we're talking something like 95% anti-religious or anti-clerical and 5% religious. And there are good reasons for that. Right, um, starting in the 1820s and 30s, when you first start to see socialism and anarchism in Europe, it is broadly speaking anti-religious and anti-clerical, largely because religion is perceived to be on the side of the state and on the side of capital and on the side of a social order that privileged nobility. And most people who were um, opposed to those things as part of socialist and anarchist movements, believed that not only are these things um, wrong because they are out of step with what modern science or modern philosophy tells us about the way the world is, but that they are oppressive and that they need to be fought. So uh, the Russian anarchist Mikhail Bakunin famously wrote in God and the State, um, in his paraphrase of the French Enlightenment philosopher Voltaire, Voltaire had written, uh, if God did not exist, humanity would have had to invent him. And Bakunin said, if God really existed, we would have to abolish him. So the form that this anti-religion takes is different depending on the anarchists. And Kenyon talks about this in his book. So if you're an Italian anarchist, the form that it takes is anti-Catholic and you have a sort of atheism that is formed by your response to and reaction to the Catholic church, its priesthood, um, the institutions of that hierarchy. In the Jewish context, it looks like a response to rabbinic authority, patriarchal authority, the role of halakha or Jewish law. Um, I'm a religious studies scholar, and in religious studies for some time now, it has been um, the main tendency to look a little bit askance at what is called secularization. So most of the most of the figures that we talk about in this book from a hundred years ago or so, they took secularization for granted. They thought that it was the way of modernity. They thought that everything was going to progress in such a manner that uh, religion would eventually disappear. Um, but in religious studies, we tend to think that secularization is not so simple and the secular cannot be marked as the absence of religion in such an easy way. And one of the ways that you can tell that is that uh, secular people, including atheists, uh, are different based on what religion it is that they reject. So Muslim atheists and Christian atheists and Jewish atheists are all rejecting something different, even though they will often speak of themselves as rejecting religion. But you can still see these specificities manifesting in their different ways of rejecting religion, 
And so the secular actually takes these very specific forms depending on what community you're studying. Um, I happen to be working from my first book project on Martin Buber, who was a Jewish philosopher in late Wilhelmine and then Weimar and then Nazi Germany before he moved to Palestine as a refugee. Um, and he was a good friend of Gustav Landauer, whom Anna mentioned in her talk. And I thought that this was an interesting way into thinking about religious anarchism. Um, one of the books that Kenyon highlighted in his slides was Chaim Rothman's No Masters But God, which mainly deals with Orthodox Jewish anarchists. Um, but Landauer was not Orthodox. He was a kind of a free floating mystic who borrowed things from Christianity or Judaism as he kind of wanted. Buber saw himself as much more solidly within the Jewish tradition, but by no means bound to halakha in the traditional way that the Orthodox community thought. So there are lots of, there's even within this tiny 5% of religious Jewish anarchists who still see this tremendous difference. Um, but the religious anarchists had a certain kind of challenge. They had challenges from two sides. On the one hand, they had the challenge from the rest of the religious community that was not anarchist and didn't understand anarchism and thought that anarchism was a scary threat. And on the other side, they had the rejection from the anarchists who didn't understand why they would remain committed to a backwards, oppressive, um, unenlightened, form of tradition that was clearly meant to be swept away by history. So to reconcile these challenges, they had to go into tradition and find resources that would help them um, understand or at least explain to others what they already believed, which was that these traditions were actually sources of liberation and not just sources of oppression, that they could certainly appear in the world as sources of oppression but that they also had within them sources of liberation. So one obvious place to see that in Judaism is the Exodus narrative, something that has traditionally meant a tremendous amount to African-American Christians in the United States, for example. The narrative of the people being liberated from slavery by God, who intends for them to create a new society that is going to be an ideal society. And that message can, of course, be understood in many ways, right? So you could then say that new society is going to look like X and then describe something that an anarchist would not like, right? But the way that the Jewish anarchists understood it was that they would highlight aspects of the society that they thought would make it into their ideal version of a society that was completely at peace, at which in which no one dominated another, in which there would be uh, institutions of equality. And so they would cite, for example, basic Jewish institutions like the Sabbath. Um, the Sabbath exists in order to remind us that we are not for work that we have to work in order to survive, but that work is not the purpose of our lives, um, and that we are supposed to live on the earth um, in connection with each other and with God, and not simply to toil, right? So they would emphasize this aspect of the Sabbath, and then they would emphasize other things that were also mentioned in the Torah. For example, the sabbatical, the remission of debt every seven years, um, the release of enslaved people, um, and the Jubilee every seven sabbaticals, every 49 years, which involved the mass redistribution of land so that any inequality that had been able to accumulate over generations um, due to just some people having good luck and other people having bad luck, that would be reset so that everybody went back to the equality that they were at the moment of the revelation. So they would emphasize these things um, and they would talk about how um, the society that was intended was supposed to be one of freedom and non-domination. And oftentimes they would extend this into other aspects of theology. The way that they would think about God, for example, would be that God intends for us to be free, even with respect to God. That's pretty different from the typical 
idea of God as a commander, right? Who issues these laws that we all have to follow. Um, there's certainly an element of that, right? Because anarchists tend to believe very strongly in the laws of ethics or the idea that we have to treat each other in certain ways. Um, but how do you enforce that, right? That's the whole discussion today among abolitionists and people who wanna talk about ways of confronting harm that don't involve punishment, imprisonment, and so on. That was an anarchist conversation as well. Um, and the last thing I wanna talk about with respect to this is the <clears throat> topic of my chapter in the book, which is the idea of temporality. So many anarchists, including many Jewish anarchists, lived in what I talked about before as a kind of a progressive temporality. The idea that we're in a revolutionary moment in history, everything is getting better, we're moving towards the revolution, right? And at some point we will achieve the revolution and history will be perfected. This is uh, famously associated with the Marx, Marxian idea of history, but um, many anarchists shared this view. Um, and in this view, right, you look to the past and you think that things that are in the past are um, not as good as the way that things are now. And the way that things are now is not as good as the way that they will be in the future. But there are many Jewish anarchists who don't live in that temporality. They live in something more like a cyclical or nonlinear temporality where they have a direct connection to ancestors and a direct connection to future people in a much more immediate way. So they're not just um, distinct from these past people who are so far away and these other future people that haven't come yet, but rather um, there's a much more direct connection. And I mention that because it's just one of these elements that I think brings Jewish anarchism potentially into very close contact, um, as Anna said before, with um, decolonial movements, with Black and Indigenous thought in many quarters of which secularism is seen as a white thing. It's seen as something that is associated with colonialism. It's seen as something that's associated with a sort of universalistic, imperialistic idea that everyone should eventually be the same and with a lack of respect for difference. And temporality is one way that that manifests. So I think it's also important to highlight that as aspect of Jewish anarchism, um, which diverges somewhat from what we might call the classical version. And I'll stop my comments there. Well, I want to thank everybody for those um, uh, just truly interesting opening comments. Sorry, I'm trying to get in the frame here. Um, and I have a number of questions. So I want to first, I will ask all of you for questions of each other. Uh, then we do already have one question in the chat. I want to remind our audience that if you want to ask a question, just put it into the chat and we'll be able to raise it up to our, our speakers. Um, and then I will ask my 75 questions because that's how many I have. Uh, so, but first of all, I just want to say, having heard each other, not you've been in conversation for a long time. That's one of the wonderful things about producing an, an anthology. And this clearly came out of a conversation between Anna and Kenyon. Um, but do you have things that you want to raise up amongst you for our audience this evening? All right. Maybe not. Well, I'll let Anna, did you want to? Um, oh, I think maybe we can start with your questions. Okay, good. I'm actually going to ask the question in the chat because I always appreciate people who are willing to ask questions. And this was while you were all talking. It's from uh, Mitchell Verter, um, and it's for all of you. So I'll give each of you a chance to respond. And the question is, um, what is the significance of creating a book, a book of remembrance, both in a Jewish sense, the people of the book commanded to remember, and for an anarchist archive? So it's about bringing those two together and then about what does it mean to have produced this book? What what does it mean when we when we put a book out into the world? Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. I think of our work as a recovery project, but not as a project of rehabilitation or mm -hmm. full recuperation. Um, I think there are ways in which 
uh, the archive is still so open. There's so much still to be done. Um, and I think there's also critique along with um, the attachment that we have to these genealogies. I think that there's still, uh, it's still important to consider, uh, for example, um, indigenous uh, inspirations for anarchist politics did not necessarily mean conversations with individual indigenous peoples um, or communities. Uh, there's a chapter on uh, or women's oral histories, and I think it shows some of the difference between the aspirations for feminism and bodily autonomy and some of the lived experiences of women in the movement. So mm -hmm. think of this uh, as a project of recovery, of archival labor, um, but not one of uh, trying to advance uh, a nostalgic rehabilitation. No, that's, that's, that's a great answer. Kenan? Yeah, I think uh, there's a couple ways of answering this question, building on what, what Anna said. I'm, on, the, on the one hand, we are very cognizant and, and hopeful uh, of the fact that this book, hopefully, or at least some of the stories in here, um, will find resonance with activists today and in the future, where they might find, if not a fully you know, um, portable, usable past, at least, el you know, usable elements of this um, largely unknown past from which they can draw, hopefully, inspiration, ideas, experiences, um, I, I recognize the multiplicity of ways of, um, of being an anarchist, of being Jewish, um, and so on sort of in a completely separate area from that um we're, we're very explicit in in uh, our framing of this book especially in the conclusion that Anna and i co-wrote uh that as much as this book is presenting a lot of new research and information it's also very much an invitation or even a a call for more research to be done um so we in that conclusion, we specifically talk about what we don't know, what hasn't been done, what um, sources and material are uh, is out there that is still waiting to really be tapped into to find even more of these stories and more histories of Jewish anarchism. Yeah, I think the conclusion is uh, just beautiful in the ways in which you both call out more research and lay out what's available already. I mean, the combination is actually kind of hard to pull off. So I, I was very moved by that. Um, Sam, I want to turn this one to you, though. So thoughts about the book as a whole. Um, I, well, I mean, I think the editors pretty much covered it. Uh, I'm just thrilled to be associated with this book in any way. Uh, Sort of like Anna said, for me, um, I don't know, it feels continuous more than like reconnecting to something. I was mm -hmm. a I was a teenage anarchist, so <laughs> I never, I never, I don't know, it was never not there for me. But then I got to graduate school and figured out that nobody else knew any of this stuff. Um, I mean, and it was interesting, like Buber, for example, who I wrote my book about, is one of the major thinkers of the 20th century in Jewish thought, but nobody talks about this aspect of him. Like it was, he was completely domesticated and turned into this nice friendly guy who wants us all to have good relationships with each other. Um, and he did want that, but that's what all anarchists want. So, uh, you know, I just feel like um, I was really, really lucky to be able to be involved with the book. Yeah, and I mean, some of what you have said have, have gone to all of my questions, both the question of, you know, what it means to create a usable history, how to draw on it. I'm going to go through them and then I'll um, uh, focus on one. The resonance question, like the, the this book feels particularly resonant at this moment for many reasons, but in part because of the resonance between the height of anarchism and the 1890s, the Gilded Age and what we're facing now. And again, for my students, a desire for an answer to capitalism that, um, holds out some of what uh, anarchism offers that's not we will now all become part of this one single world that that is the Marxist response. 
Um, and then this this question about the, that Buber wanted everybody to be nice to each other and that anarchism does as well is that the question of a beautiful world, can we create a world that has you know beauty and what are the again resources and tradition? So I'm gonna start with the resonance question though because it was the one that I felt really reading the book. It just felt so powerfully resonant. And um, in that sense, it's very hard not to read this as a reflection on that our, that what I was feeling is because of the ways in which our times reflect, especially the late 18th century and, and uh, the ways in which capitalism was working at that time. So what did you all think of resonance? Does that speak to you that, it, that it's in part about um, this just, um, you know, tremendous world of inequality and the desire for something else? Um, what else do you find resonant now? I'm going to have to start calling on you. So. Yeah, Kenyon. I was just I muted my. I, I'm not prepared yet um, <laughs> to answer that question. But so, I mean, so I think one of the things that Anna and Sam both mentioned about speaking of, of resonance, right, is um, there's, I think, there's a definite resonance between right the linguistic and the cultural, and even in some cases the religious. Um, elements of and and sort of combinations and, and matrices of uh, these past Jewish anarchists and Jewish anarchisms and contemporary concerns with you know so-called identity politics but how do we you know how do we how do we be have both an identity but also not be you know have that identity cloister you off um, you know, how does one embody in what we today would call intersectionality? Um, how how is one to be you know oneself but also with others? Um, and I think we see a lot of variations on that theme in, in a lot of these examples, uh, right? Which are not generally the sort of right the universalist. Well, we're all going to learn Esperanto, or we're all going to speak English because we're in America, or or whatnot. Um, but rather, right, something that I, I've written about quite a bit, right, which is the, this more sort of radical cosmopolitan outlook, uh, which gets to that Kropotkin quote that, that um, Anna mentioned and, and quoted, right, this idea that cultural diversity um, in terms, you know, today what we would call, you know, ethnic identity, ethnic diversity, as well as linguistic diversity, um, is in itself a positive good that needs to be retained and nurtured, but not um, chauvinistic, right? Not um, all cultures have value, but none are better than another, right? Um, there's, so one of the, the later or mid 20th century editors of the the Yiddish anarchist paper, the Freie Arbeiterstimme, the Free Voice of Labor, uh, Hermann Frank uh, wrote, uh, the way he, he put it was, uh, the anarchists should be interested in what he called ethnocultural freedom, as opposed to, in his words, harmful and world destroying ethnocentrism. And I think that's mm -hmm. a really critical distinction that in a lot of contemporary uh, rhetoric often gets kind of lost. Good. Anybody else want to uh, respond to resonance? Um, I think there are a thousand resonances. I think the aesthetic which you point to is one, this insistence on beauty as a form of defiance against austerity. I think that resonates particularly today. I showed some of the images from the Yiddish anarchist press to emphasize, right, they're, they're so rococo, they're so baroque, there's such an insistence on the fullness of life and delight in beauty. And when we think of the... Um, the material reality of the lives of people who were making these newspapers. We think of uh, the physical labor of toiling in a sweatshop, of mm -hmm. 
uh, being a typesetter and the very physical labor, right, of the dust and the ink and the toll on the body, we can see even more um, how heightened this insistence on beauty is. Um, so I think this is one particular uh, aspect in terms of resistance to austerity um, that we can see expressed in it. Um, I think also the articulation of a transnational culture, which is not aspiring to statehood, has con um, contemporary resonances with Puerto Rican liberation movements and Kurdish liberation movements and uh, Romani articulations as well um, of what a non-territorial identity means. And I don't want to overdetermine um, the uh, or collapse the differences between these movements, but to think also, um, to think with them, to think together with them, uh, the Yiddish and the Kurdish and the Puerto Rican and these other, uh, these other articulations. Um, and if it's okay, I wanted to um, uh, mention also uh, in my other book, which just came out, Horizons Blossom, Borders Vanish, it opens with a moment in 1907 when the Zionist Congress and the Anarchist Congress are meeting down the street from one another just by coincidence uh, in Amsterdam and in The Hague. And there's this moment when this uh, journalist named uh, Ruben Brennan, who is at the Zionist Congress, bumps into this woman in a cafe and he sees her sitting there at night surrounded by pamphlets and she's drinking schnapps out of a soup tureen and smoking a cigar and he has this meeting with her and it turns out that it's Emma Goldman and she's down the street. And so thinking about uh, this moment of encounter in 1907 when each movement is trying to articulate what it sees as the essence of a Jewish politics, um, I think is, is important to think with this, move, this moment. Um, so if I can uh, just read a couple uh, lines. So this was from an article uh, written in Yiddish that I found in an archive. And uh, Emma Goldman is speaking with Ruben Brennan, and they're each arguing which is the real spirit of Jewishness. Is it to aspire to statehood or is it to resist the idea of the nation state? And Goldman says, quote, we people have enough trouble from the state without establishing another one and becoming like the old bandits. You want to come up with a new Jewish state, but no, I think that the task of the Jews and their assignment in the world is to demolish and make a furnace of the nation state. And so we see in this moment, right, this was a debate in 1907, each are trying to articulate this idea of what it means to be a people. And they both have very essentialist ideas. Um, but Goldman is trying to make a genealogy uh, from within Jewish diaspora that articulates a resistance to representational politics or state incorporation or seeing the state as the guarantor of human rights. Um, and she's doing that from inside of a Jewish genealogy, which, by the way, is very different from the way Goldman speaks in English. Oh, that, that's interesting. And I'm going to follow up with one of the questions from the chat here. Um, which also is about language, you know, and Anna, you were, um, you know, making a, an eloquent argument for why multilingualism was uh, important throughout the anarchist uh, movements that you write about. Um, and yet many of the uh, presses, et cetera, were in Yiddish. So one of the questions is about why is anarchism specifically widespread um, among Jews? And is it related to the prevalence of Yiddish until 1948 as a worldwide language? Um, so for example, um, volunteers in the Spanish Civil War could talk amongst themselves in Yiddish and, and the like. So how is the sort of, what's the relation between the breadth of Yiddishness and yet the breadth of the multilingualism that you talked about? Thank you, that's a great question. Um, not only could, uh, uh, Yiddish speakers communicate with one another transnationally, but they could also often communicate with the German language, mm -hmm. uh, German immigrant anarchists, which is really key in Chicago around Haymarket and also um, around early labor movements in New York City. Uh, thinking of um, uh, uh, one of uh, some of the chapters uh, in our book, um, uh, by Tom Goyens looks at this connection between the German non-Jewish anarchist movement, the um, longshoremen and other early uh, unions. So uh, if we think of, uh, right, with uh, uh, with uh, thinking of Derrida and monolingualism as, as, a, as illusory, in fact, Yiddish could, um, Yiddish speakers could communicate 
transnationally, not only with Yiddish speakers, but those whose language is proximate to Yiddish. Um, that said, there is so much research that still needs to be done. For example, about Balkan Jews who were fighting in the Spanish Civil War, Ladino speakers, uh, uh, Sephardic Jews, Spanish Jews who were already in Spain, who were not part of the Yiddish speaking anti-fascists who came to fight in the Abraham Lincoln brigades or elsewhere. So there's still a lot of research to be done around this question um, of uh, Jewish anarchist multilingualism. And I would also point to the work of Devin Nahr, who, um, whose project forthcoming is about uh, Ladino speaking Jews in Chicago and New York City and their collaboration with Latino, particularly the Puerto Rican Spanish speaking workers. So while Yiddish and German speakers were able to collaborate in, in anarchist movements, there's also the proximity of Ladino and Spanish, which created coalitions um, between those who speak uh, Spanish and Ladino, which is uh, has aspects of old Spanish in it. Um, so it's not only Yiddish within oneself, Ladino within oneself, but also the proximity to German and to Spanish that allows coalitions to be to emerge. That's lovely. I have to admit that I did come out of the book thinking I need to learn a lot more languages. So um, we have another question that I'm going to read to you, um, which is uh, uh, a question for everyone. I am a Jewish college student who, like many of my peers, have found ourselves searching for a new way to connect to Judaism outside of the Zionist framework that we were raised into. Do you see this history as a potential source for reimagining a post-Zionist landscape for us as Jews? Followed by, personally, I do and am incredibly grateful for all of the work that you all are doing. So it's, it's always good to hear that we're reaching uh, students. And what are, what is, how would any of you like to respond? Uh, I'll, I'll take it. I, I think that... Um, one of the things that has happened, and I think this is part of, I was, it's connected to the resonance issue, right? Because this mm -hmm. is the second Gilded Age. Right. And a lot of the stuff that we're talking about is from the first Gilded Age. And the subsequent history, right, is that Jews are able in the United States to um, assimilate into whiteness. Mm -hmm. And the next generations are less affiliated with radical politics and they also are less affiliated with the Yiddish language. Um, and part of that is a story of, that's a, that's a US story that is something that is also true of, of the Italian community, of the Irish community, right? Um, but what's interesting about Jews demographically, sociologically that sociologists have noted compared to those other communities and the conservative sociologist Milton Hemelfarb famously said this sometime in the mid-century, I don't remember exactly when, in the 50s or 60s, but he said, Jews earn like Episcopalians, but vote like Puerto Ricans. Um, and this sort of is like the last after gasp of this radical legacy, right? The idea that Jews are just disproportionately Democrats. But that took McCarthyism, mm -hmm. the combination, there's a push and a pull, right? There's on the one hand, there's the whiteness and the the, uh, the option of moving to the suburbs and becoming a middle-class person. And on the other hand, there's a danger of like actual government persecution that associates Jews with communism. Um, and so put those things together and you get at least a generation of young Jews in America, two generations, three generations being taught that um, to be Jewish is just like to be Catholic or Protestant in America. This is a wonderful mosaic country where you can be at least one of three different religions. <laughs> um, and also we have this other state that's in another part of the world that's also really great that you can support. And it's just like a sort of naturalization of what is in fact an extremely recent state of affairs, right? So I think it actually, for people who are trying to look for alternative modes of Jewishness, I think it helps tremendously to know that this form of Jewishness is about 50 years old which in Jewish time is basically nothing. It's nothing. So, uh, and it's already over because you can see, um, the reason I started out talking about the second Gilded Age is that what happens in the Gilded Age is that the extremes pull away from each other and people fall out of the middle. So I think that's one of the resonances. Like when people who are in the middle are being proletarianized again, you see the resurgence of proletarian politics. And that class element is really important and can't be written out of this either. Mm 
Um, thank you. So we Can have oh, one quick opinion. Yeah, please, no, do. There, please do. Please do. Please do. Just, just in, in terms of right, it, is this a potential for reimagining a post science landscape? Um, I think hopefully yes. It's also a way. Right, it's also recovering a, a pre-Zionist landscape in a way. Um, I think it's really easy to forget that before World War One and and the Balfour Declaration um, in 1917, there were many times in in you know in New York in the United States there were many times more Jewish socialists and anarchists uh, and and participants in those movements than there were participants in the Zionist movement. Um, and that's you know just over a hundred years ago. It, it's it's a completely different kind of Jewish political landscape, particularly before World War One, than the one that has come to become hegemonic and seem and in that process has sort of presented itself as always having been that way. Yeah, and now the chat is uh, filling up with um, more comments and everything, and we'll try to preserve that for you all so that you can see it, but there's a lot of appreciation. I wanna ask, uh, make sure we do have some time left, which is great. Um, and I, I, there's, again, a lot that I wanna move on to, but I wanna make sure that we talk about mutual aid, um, in part because as you know, BCRW has done a lot of work, especially over the pandemic on, on mutual aid, especially with our, uh, uh, a longtime uh, colleague and, and um, collaborator, um, Dean Spade. But this feels like one of the things that, again, our students are super interested in and um, that this tradition, these traditions that you're talking about offer um, uh, ways of understanding mutual aid and, and what it is and, and why we might be committed to it. So I was wondering if you would be willing to comment on that. Sure, thank you. Um, and Dean Spade, of course, wrote a, a wonderful book titled Mutual Aid. Um, so one of the um, arguments that Emma Goldman makes in this, this same period in 1907 and the 1935 article is she's arguing for anarchism as a Jewish practice because she's looking at genealogies of mutual aid already within Jewish culture. One of the um, aspects that she points to is Hasidic mutual aid, the building, for example, um, of, of uh, community support within a religious community. Um, but she's also thinking of uh, Landsmannschaft. Um, so thinking about uh, when a community moves, say, from Europe to New York or to Philadelphia, you might try to find your Landsman, that is someone who came from the same village as you. Uh, and so there were these mutual aid practice, practices set up. And when Goldman is trying to uh, make an argument for anarchism as something which is already imminent, that is something which is already inside of this world. She's looking to these genealogies of religious practices of mutual aid. And one of the key um, arguments which Kropotkin makes in mutual aid is it's not another world is possible, it's that there are many worlds inside of this one. And so he's looking at anthropology and zoology to show that it's mutual aid and solidarity which allows us all to survive rather than competition as the engine um, of evolution. And so for Goldman and for Kropotkin and for others who are uh, practicing mutual aid, they're seeking genealogies of that practice already in this world. Um, so this is one thing to one thing to point to. And when I was at Yiva, which is a, a the primary Yiddish archive in New York City, I looked through all of these ledger books of mutual aid societies, some of which would identify themselves as anarchist, and some of which were community organizations for the redistribution of wealth, the support, for example, of women whose husbands had disappeared and they didn't know, they didn't have divorce papers, so they could not remarry. And so there were these mutual aids um, systems set up for, uh, for women um, who were 
uh, experiencing economic oppression. Um, so this conversation about mutual aid extends far back and one might look to religious genealogies to these cultural groups, these Landsman formations, as well as these anarchist mutual aid groups, uh, some of which um, I went to Toronto and looked at an archive and looked at the newspapers and pamphlets um, of those who had survived concentration camps and afterwards were building anarchist mutual aid support for fellow survivors. Um, so we might think of this uh, as a political practice, which is also drawing inspiration from, um, from long genealogies of community care. Uh, thank you, and I, I, I want to follow up with you, if you don't mind, on, on the, what you brought up in the very beginning about the idea of the book as a recovery project, but not a full rehabilitation. Because it's so easy, for me at least, to be inspired by these histories in a way of, this is so amazing. Look at what people have done in the past. I, too, teach religious studies, so I'm, you know, look, all these resources for you, um, you know, on over these long, long histories. Like, to be able just to introduce our students, and Sam, I may, if we have time, come back to you about the um, nonlinear temporality, but just being able to introduce the students to a longer history than than the one that they're used to hearing about is so valuable. So what are some of the things we, uh, as when we are inspired by um, these resources, should be looking out for as potential pitfalls or ways to uh, attend with care uh, to th these pasts and, and to their histories and, and to the resources as we try to uh, bring them more fully into our lives. Thank you. Well, I think, uh, for example, I was just speaking about looking at these mutual, these ledgers of mutual aid. And so these were ledger books that documented how wealth was being redistributed, run by these uh, anarchist groups. And one might ask, how quickly does this become administrative? How are they actually making decisions about who is worthy? of receiving aid and care, right? So that might be one lens uh, for reading these, right? If there's a note um, about uh, saying, ah, this person seems to be able-bodied, why aren't they working instead of receiving aid, right? So we might have an attunement to these moments uh, of judgment in the archive um, as well. Where does an administrative uh, practice come in amidst this um, aspiration towards total mutual aid. Um, so we could think of that as a reading practice when we encounter these histories. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that, that, that we have to attend to the ways in which we read now. And I guess, it, you know, following up for both uh, uh, you, Sam, and, and, and Kenyon, you know, Sam, I was just very taken with the idea of the nonlinear um, uh, approach to time. Um, and the ways in which, uh, uh, along with the non-territorial non, non linguistic approach where you just push away from the various ways in which we create borders in our lives that narrow uh, down uh, and create a, a past, a, a future that is utterly determined by the past um, instead of open to possibility. Um, and so I was wondering if you would talk a little bit more just about what the implications of that are. In other words, the argument is beautifully laid out in the book, but how do you see the implications of what that might be for those of us who are trying to read various histories or different traditions as we do in religious studies? Um, well, for me, one of the implications is I think I'm always, um, I'm always thinking about Landauer saying that, um, you know, there are these there are these moments of rupture and these things that create distance between us and people of the past, things that make us not understand them. But he at one point is talking about a rupture at a completely different moment, the rupture of the agricultural revolution, you know, mm -hmm. 7000 years ago or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he says that was so recent in the history of the human species as a whole. So how can you not think of yourself as comrades with everyone in, in that time frame? You know, um, and I think that the, a lot of anthropology on the rise of the state, for example, I think is so useful in thinking about ways in which what we have to face today is not so different from what was faced in Sumeria or Mesopotamia or ancient Israel, right? And there's a reason that these things are resonant is because the forms of extraction and exploitation that were created by the first states are still with mm -hmm. us. And so we can learn from the people who lived before that and that's like one of the reasons that um, deep history is so useful. And I'm inspired by David Graeber on that mm -hmm. score, for example. Um, 
but like also that sense of possibility, the idea that um, we're not locked in yeah. to these trajectories. Right. And I think that's one of the challenges for me um, of assimilating Marxist thought about capitalism, which is many useful, which is really useful in a lot of ways. But also there's this idea of capitalism as a machine that just runs on this, it like it's going to do what it's going to do. It has to do it. And we're, we're just all caught in the gears of it. And it can often feel like, well, how do you get out other than the specific way that they prescribed for you in 1917, or you just get run over by the gears, right? So I think that that's one of the things that I find useful about this, about these kinds of histories. And I'll just mention one more thing is that to the last question, there's also just the history for Jews of the Kahal or the Kahila, which is the the autonomous Jewish community wherever Jews lived. Mm -hmm. and, and to your last question, it's important to think of that in that same way, because in this time frame, many anarchists were just always thinking, well, Jews as a diasporic people have always governed ourselves, so we can just keep doing that. But, you know, those communities were also oligarchic. They mm -hmm. were um, very subject to the power of a few wealthy people. Oftentimes, particular rabbinic authorities might have been able to accumulate too much power. And so they didn't have some of the mechanisms, for example, that the Highland people of Southeast Asia that James Scott talks about in The Art of Not Being Governed had to prevent the development of those types of power. So that's another thing that like is a caution. Like you can't romanticize the Kaha because mm -hmm. it was subject to these sorts of, on, on the other hand, it was better than the uh, Byzantine empire, I think. Like, so, you know, you get both. Yeah, Anna. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I wanted to just build on what Sam was saying about temporality and mention that while, uh, you know, our book is uh, some of the first history of Jewish anarchism written in English, there are several works of, uh, hit, you know, uh, histories of anarchism written uh, in Yiddish and in other languages. And one of the um, uh, striking aspects is how concerned all of these historians were with genealogy mm -hmm. and how disparate they each narrate the history of anarchism. Um, Yosef Ludin, for example, uh, in his uh, Kurze Geschichte von Anarchistische Gedanke, A Brief History, uh, of Jewish anarchism, he's he's talking about the Essenes, right, as this kind of egalitarian brotherhood, as, as being maybe they were the first anarchists, maybe Gideon in the Bible who refuses to become king, maybe he's the first anarchist. And so everyone's very, very interested in this question of lineage and, and what genealogy to construct. Um, it's just that ours is in English. So. <laughs> Um, that's lovely. And I um, will want to make room for everybody if they have a final comment. But my final question is about the title, um, which I found very moving. And you, I'm going to invite, you know, especially uh, Kenyon, you haven't talked a lot recently, and then Anna to talk a little bit more about the title. But also what struck me about it um, uh, with freedom in our ears was literally the embodied sense of it. Um, uh, my colleague Manajay Maradian has just written a very important book called This Flame Within, which is also about in the embodiment of a re revolutionary spirit amongst um, student activists, especially um, in the Iranian diaspora. And so, you know, I'm very interested in this question of the ways in which the um, the poetry that you begin with, that words, language can both evoke liberation and possibility, but also how they help us to embody it. This doesn't have to be where you go with it. I'm just more interested in hearing about the title, but that's what it did for me. Um, yeah, so Anna really deserves credit for identifying that particular um, stanza from uh, Dovid Adelstadt's poem, as one of particularly appropriate, um, although right, we did um, we did alter it for the purpose of the title by make, for, right, from the singular to to the plural. So mm -hmm. went from with freedom in my ears, freedom in our ears, uh -huh. right, as a way to I, I suppose sort of invite the reader to be part of that collective um, and. I think to signal that despite the fact that the the different histories revealed in the book in many ways are very different from one another, they are still connected. Um, 
they are right um, very diverse parts of a interconnected whole. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I'll let Anna speak more to the question of embodiment. And then the the right the, the subtitle histories of Jewish anarchism. Again, we really wanted to emphasize the the diversity. In fact, if we had had our way, I think it would have been called histories of Jewish anarchisms, plural. But I think the publisher would have murdered us. So. Oh, I I actually thought that was the title. I guess uh, you know, um, uh, and and I just want to say that one of the things the book evokes greatly is precisely this: the diverse parts of an interconnected whole, the ability to hold difference and make connection at the same time. The whole book, I feel like, does a really beautiful job with that. Obviously, coming out of this tradition, you might expect that, but you all still do a great job in evoking that. So that's that's one of the things I got from reading the book. So Anna. Um, yeah, thank you for asking this question. Um, so an interesting aspect of David Edelstadt is that he went from uh, Russia through London to uh, Cincinnati and he became radicalized through this, um, you know, through his encounters in the UK as well as in the US. And when he was in Cincinnati, he actually heard Albert Parsons, who was one of the Haymarket, um, so-called Haymarket martyrs, one of the um, one of the several men who were uh, executed by the state, um, who were um, primarily German anarchists uh, in 1886 in Chicago. And so Edelstadt actually heard Parsons give this uh, rabble rousing talk. And Edelstadt later wrote a suite of poems uh, in Yiddish for each of the men, uh, each of the Haymarket men. And you can hear in the language that Edelstadt uses, the echoes and the voices of the men at Haymarket. Um, and one of the, um, the last words um, of August, uh, August Spies, uh, who was um, hanged, his last words were, the day will come when our silence will be more powerful than the voices you strangle today. And uh, Edelstadt translated that into Yiddish and wrote a poem using the last words of the Haymarket Martyrs. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the uh, one of the uh, speeches that um, that uh, uh, Spies gave in court, um, he says, uh, "Here we will tread upon a spark. Here, here, behind you, in front of you, everywhere, there is a subterranean fire that you cannot put out. The ground is on fire where you stand." And this was part of a courtroom speech at Haymarket and Edelstadt translated that into Yiddish as well into poetry. So I think um, in the line with freedom in our ears, there's also this echo of the docu poetics that Edelstadt and other anarchist poets are in conversation um, with anarchist speech at rallies, translating courtroom orations. Um, it's also there, there's this kind of echo of a collective anarchist voice. Um, and just a quick follow up, uh, which is I will read the whole thing because um, uh, Valerie Hunt is asking, beloved A.E. Torres, how may we get uh, uh, this set of poems? Um, the Edelstadt poems? Uh, I think so. I think that's um, the reference. Yeah. Sure. Um, so I write about Edelstadt and I translate some of his Yiddish poems in um, my uh, other book, not the anthology, but this one, <laughs> Horizons Blossom, Borders Vanish. Um, it's all on uh, poetry and Yiddish anarchist literature. So there's a chapter um, that that translates some of some more of Edelstadt's um, poetry. Um, and and Valerie Hunt also offers a quote that that I guess is from these related poems that um, is related to the title of uh, my colleague Manajay Meradian's book, "The Ground Is on Fire Where You Stand." Um, so yeah, I, I I should have saved that to the end, but I do want to give you all a chance here um, at the end. We're almost at time to um, final thoughts. So um, Sam, let's start at, just because you're at, you're at the left end of my um, uh, uh, um, screen. Sure. I mean, I don't know if this is appropriately summary, but it's more just because Anna just mentioned Albert Parsons. Um, and I think about him sometimes because he was a Confederate soldier before. Mm -hmm. And then after the war, he became a Republican and then he became a socialist labor organizer and, and an anarchist. And I think about his trajectory sometimes. And of course he married Lucy Parsons, um, a, a wonderful um, anarchist activist as well. And I think about him because we often, I think part of the stuckness of our moment 
is that we imagine our enemies a lot. Um, people who can't change, people who are immune to reason and who are locked in hate and all these kinds of things. And I think one of the things that you can learn from studying these kinds of histories is not just the sense of social possibility, but the sense of individual possibility that someone like Albert Parsons could go from fighting for the slave power to uh, advocating for the rights of freedmen, um, even when it incurred the absolute hatred and fury of all of the people that he had known before um, and got him the enmity of the Ku Klux Klan. And I think in this moment, especially when we are so often overwhelmed by what it what feels like uh, a really massive wall of impenetrable fascist opposition, uh, it's good to remind ourselves that that kind of surprise is also possible on the individual level. It seems like ending on the idea of surprise, and I'll give you Kenan and Anna a chance to end as well, is the perfect place to end an anarchist um, uh, um, uh, set of possibilities. Is you know, We hope, I mean, it's one of the hopes is that the world can surprise you. Um, so yeah, thank you, Sam. Kenyon, what, what are your final thoughts? Well, all right, I'm gonna to try to, to bring together a bunch, uh, the notion of surprise and the notion of mutual aid and the notion of, of uh, alternatives to Zionist frameworks um, in one anecdote, which I tell often, which is um, after the Second World War, uh, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union was aiding uh, Jewish survivors in Europe. And one of the people they sent was the anarchist and labor organizer, Rose Posada, who's fairly well known, although not well known as an anarchist. Um, and in one of her reports, she wrote back from visiting uh, what remained of the, the Woj ghetto in Poland, um, where she met with survivors of the small Jewish anarchist group there. Um, and she wrote back that she was surprised that none of them asked for, uh, for visas to get to either the US or, or Palestine. Um, they didn't ask for monetary aid, except in order to purchase a linotype machine, a, a Polish language linotype machine, so that they could take up publishing works on anarchism and mutual aid to distribute to their Polish neighbors. So not a, not a Yiddish language press, they wanted a Polish language press to reach out to their Polish neighbors, who if you know much about Poland in World War II and the Holocaust, this is a dramatic and surprising uh, right, sort of act of faith in, I think, what, what Sam was talking about, the changeability and the potential for, um, for mutual aid and creating a better world, even in the aftermath of you know, one of the most horrific uh, slaughters and, and events in, in human history. That, that, that that's, uh, does bring so many things together. So Anna, just very quickly, because we're uh, one minute over now, um, what final thoughts do you have? Uh, sure, yeah, I would follow up uh, what Kenyon said that I've seen similar accounts uh, in other parts of the world of those who had survived the camps and tried to organize afterwards. And uh, it's very humbling to spend time in the archives and, uh, and to have this encounter uh, with their political imaginations, the way in which they practice care for one another, the way in which they tried to transform every situation, even inside of incarceration. And uh, Kenyon's work on the SS Buford, which was a ship of mass deportation, uh, Kenyon writes about uh, the formation of basically uh, workers' councils amongst the deportees on this ship as it was uh, heading back to Russia and uh, that it left, um, you know, it left with uh, there being soldiers, military, sailors, and the deportees. But then when they landed, um, Alexander Berkman uh, was basically elected while on the ship to be the negotiator. And um, through the, the, the constant uh, exposure to anarchist processing and decision-making and debate, um, by the time they landed, the sailors uh, found uh, a lot of inspiration as well and, and rearranged the internal hierarchies of this uh, carceral ship. So I recommend uh, Kenyon's scholarship as well. Well, well, and I just want, I want to thank you all for the book. I want to thank you for the inspiration. I did want to say our last question was whether this event will be online and you'll be able to find it on BCRW's YouTube page. Um, and our next event um, at BCRW is an in-person event on the book Care, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, 
with uh, Premlin Addison, my co-director here at BCRW, and Dorothy Roberts in conversation. That's an in-person event. Registration is full. So if you haven't registered yet, uh, you will have to watch that one online too. It will come up online uh, a few days after uh, the event itself. Uh, but thank you all for writing this book, for being here tonight, and thank you everybody who uh, uh, joined us this evening. It was it was inspiring. It truly was. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for hosting us.